Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pena. Today's episode is a special presentation of the film Raisin Rosedale, featuring the students of the LaGuardia Community College theater program. The film explores gentrification, discrimination, and poverty as seen through the lens of the play A Raisin in the Sun. After the film, we'll speak to the cast and crew. We are now happy to present to you Raisin Rosedale. Enjoy. Mama, she's the head of the household. She's the mother of Walter and Benita, and the grandmother of Travis. Um, Ruth is her daughter-in-law. They're getting $10,000 because of um, her, her husband has passed. He had money from his, I guess, his union. And she buys a house in this white neighborhood, Clybourne Park. And this is a huge deal. It's showing that they've, they're successful because they can afford that now, but now it's like there's another problem. It's like, are you wanted there? It's, Yes, you've reached there financially, but are you going to reach there um, culturally? The audition process was very difficult for the role of Walter, and it was Derek who uh, was so honest and truthful. You know, his experience with his own child and having to deal with going to school full-time, working full-time, taking care of her, he really understood what it was like to try to raise a family under some very difficult circumstances. Mama, where have you been? You didn't go do something with that insurance money. Something crazy. Mama is a mother who actually um, gets money from the uh, insurance from his father who died. I guess she didn't get the approval of Walter, who, who was supposed to be in charge of everything. It's that fear of him not being able to take care of his family, which drives him to do what he's doing throughout this play. Especially like with me, I have a daughter. So, you know, I, I kind of got to, you know, keep that up. Uh, ambition and things going like that, so yeah. I wish you'd say how deep down inside, you think I've done the right thing. My mama is a little over a middle-aged woman and she's a very determined woman. She is a very fearless woman. Mama is a hard role too, to play age, to play the depth of what she's experiencing and the care that she wants for her family. That's really hard stuff and Tyra Nailed it. Walter Lee, it makes a difference in a man where he can walk on flows that belong to him. She wants to buy a house for her family, but her son wants to invest in a liquor store. But she doesn't want, like, just like a liquor store. My family, we're not gonna do that with the money. Well, what you think your grandmama gonna do with that money? I don't know, grandmama. She went out and she bought you a house. I played Ruth Yugger. Um, she's the wife of Walter Lee, and she tries her very best to keep the family together. Clybourne Park? Mama, there ain't no colored people living in Clybourne Park. Well, I guess it's gonna be some now. Mama, she brought in the news that she bought a house, and they're living in Clybourne Park, which is a neighborhood where there's um, a lot of white people, and they kind of sort of get like these warnings of, oh, don't move here, it's a very bad place, you're not wanted here. Uh, I am from the Clybourne Park Improvement Association. It's hard to play this character that is kind of the bad guy in the scene who comes in and wants the family to move away and, you know, negotiating this deal. But we had to do some research on to thinking, you know, who is this guy underneath it all? And why would he come and say these things to this family to get them to move? And what kind of pressures was he under? He's this, uh, well, he's racist. That's, there's that. But he's the guy who comes to um, the younger home to tell them that they cannot, basically that they should not, or that they don't want them in Clybourne Park. That for the happiness of, of, of those concerned, that, that our Negro families are, are happier when they live in their own communities. This, friends, is the welcoming committee. I play Benita, and she's an interesting character. Her attitude is like I'm the smartest one in the household. Benita 
that role. She's very famous. The, there's that wonderful monologue that she has about um, what she's, you know, fighting against and what she wants to become. It's kind of the quintessential African American female monologue. As college students, how do you guys relate to Benita? She feels like if she can be a doctor and graduate college, that's a success within itself. She is that enlightened one, that one that sees the way out, the one that sees, all right, black people can do this, black people are great, black people are this, and they're not seeing it. Regardless of what goes on in the house, I'm still following my dream. So I have a goal that I'm going to meet. Historically, this story is true. Chicago, Detroit, New York, other cities. What if a brave family never did that? I wouldn't be sitting at this table with you right now. If you were really living in this circumstance, what, what, would what you guys because you would move there? Having a good neighborhood with good neighbors and and good people. Those aren't good neighbors, so. So you, you got to take that into consideration. It's not a good neighborhood for them because they, those people are not good neighbors to them. So they are bad neighbors. When we first started shopping for a house in Laurelton, mm -hmm. uh, the broker took us to see a particular house and it was nice. We, we liked it. It was somewhat on the order of what we wanted. And we put a deposit that day. Well, that evening when we got home, the broker called and said that uh, he had gotten a call from the seller that they had a meeting after we left. The neighbors had a meeting at, at the seller's house after we left and told her that she had better not sell that house to mm. a black family. Mm. And uh, they were very adamant about it, and so she became frightened, really. And she called the broker and said that she, she changed her mind. She didn't want to sell the house to us because it made their neighbors angry and so forth. Uh, on the right of Merrick Boulevard <coughs> were stucco houses, one family, nice stucco houses. But seemingly, the people that lived in those houses were very adamant about, against blacks moving in. They were threatening people. And a few blacks that moved in, they had uh, like little small fire bombs and whatnot thrown in their yard. I did not experience that, but that's right on the opposite side of Merrick Boulevard. And uh, they would put uh, notes and signs in front of their house and whatnot, you know, like nigger, get out, and that kind of a thing. How can you go about going against your entire community just because you want to live there, knowing that they're going to treat you like Why go through that? It's like, a bit of why go through that when you have kids? Be, um, the house is messed up. I'm going to go buy this house mm -hmm. in a neighborhood that we're clearly not accepted in. Why would you do that? Yeah. Like, why, like, who would do that? You know what I mean? Like, not saying that it's okay, but it's like some things you just have to face. Like, okay, wherever they, you know, um, it's just like that neighborhood is just not for you. Wasn't there no other houses nowhere? Them houses they put up for colors way out seem to cost twice as much as the other houses. I did the best I could. Somebody has to do, somebody has to do it, but... It just chooses who wants to who wants to take that punch in the face. If I have a dream, you're not gonna tell me that if I have the possibility to achieve it, I'm not gonna go and do it because I'm scared of something. Especially when I've grown from generations and generations of my people fighting for what we believe in. Should they accept defeat? Exactly. Is that gonna is that gonna promote mm -hmm. change? Mm -hmm. Exactly. What if they're the family that does that? What if they're the ones that are that are gonna be in history that are like, oh, they moved there and then then it, it was a progressive thing. And in this play, we don't really know what's gonna happen until very close to the end when Linda comes back again and we're all waiting to find out how Walter's going to react. When it gets like that in life, you just gotta do something different. You just gotta push on out and do something bigger. Some of them, you know, halfway through would say, I'm gonna take the money. But then when we got to the end of the play, many of them changed their mind and said, you know what, no. This is what's more important is standing our ground, that we, are, we deserve equality, we deserve to be in this neighborhood, we have the money, why can't we be here? And so I think it really brought up some personal things inside of them. 
some people go through things, so the so the next generation won't have to go through it. So sometimes I would see if they was to move into the house, that would be them building a bridge. Mm -hmm. Build sometimes you yeah you have if you up for it then yeah you know right. <laughs> yes. if you're not if you're not built for that then you know it's it's not for you you know some some someone else can do it but somebody has to do it. This is my daughter. And she makes the sixth generation of our family in this country. We all thought about your offer. Good, good. And we decided to move into our house. Because my father, my father earned it for us, brick by brick. My mind was set that when I'm ready to buy a house, that's where I'm going. And, and I did, and uh, so we bought a beautiful um, English tutor. At that time, I might have been, our family may have been maybe the, I will just say the 10th black family in Laurelton. Why we look at Raisin in the Sun as the quintessential African-American 1950s Chicago experience, how we lead into today, New York, Chicago, Detroit, where gentrification is right now, what's happening, how it's affecting them in their own lives, in their own neighborhoods. We're in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, New York. This is one of the most gentrified areas in Brooklyn right now. I grew up here, I lived here for about 18 years. In this area, it's the financial problems that are moving people out. Not really fears, you know? People can't afford it anymore, so they're going. And the people who can't afford it are coming. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us like, like why that was awkward in there. It was awkward because they're somewhat of the reason why people are moving out and they're the cause for the higher rent. Yeah, this is my neighborhood. I grew up here, I miss it. It's changed a lot. It's almost not even familiar anymore. Well, I lived on this block. The renters that we were renting from sold the house, did not tell us, and basically the new landlord didn't want us. Eventually, we had to go or else we would face ev eviction. Oh, we had, um... 167 Clay Avenue in the Bronx. I've been living here pretty much since I was born. So, um, yeah, in the 90s, it was very different. There was a lot of, you know, drug dealing, a lot of uh, crimes and stuff. I guess they're trying to attract the white people to come here. That's why they're renovating. That These buildings, like this building right here, looks like a building downtown of Manhattan, like, uh, you know, a $3,000 rent, $4,000, you know, rent apartment. I think they're really trying to attract the white people here and move us, the minorities, out and to relate that to, um, you know, Raising in the Sun, the white people in that neighborhood are feeling kind of threatened, you know, about that. So they want to keep it white and that's it. But, you know, um, here it's just like, it's the opposite. We, they're trying to kick us out and they're getting white people in here. So it's like, I mean, we can't win. We can't win. maybe once a week, twice a week. But it's like literally one day I came and it was just here. And I was like, well, where did this come from? And then this was all under construction. And then one day I came here and all of this was here. And I'm just like, wait, where, where did this come from? I'm not gonna recognize my neighborhood anymore at all. Yeah, this, this is one of the many buildings actually around that's being built. One on almost every, the course of every two blocks is like, what do you, what, like we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know what to expect. People moving out of their house because of money issues. People selling other people's homes just so they can have it. And not thinking about, okay, this is where they were raised. This is where they are, they're from. So why not like leave them, let them live in this area? So I didn't really look into that 
until I read The Razor and the Sun. I didn't know that people really go through this. So many people call my mom's right. phone. Like literally, like they call my, like hi, are you interested in selling? Hi, are you interested? Like they even call my phone. They call, they, yeah, they call my phone sometimes. Like hi, are you interested in selling? It's like, oh, we bought your house. Oh, we bought your apartment. Oh, we bought your building. And it's like, like how can I stop this from happening? I don't want to keep my building. I'm not saying that you can't move in, but I don't want to keep mine. It's different when the threat is not more so like, you know what, we're just coming in and we're just gonna live here peacefully in harmony and everything's gonna be fine. It's a threat when it's like, I'm taking over your neighborhood. Like I'm completely just changing everything and there's nothing you can do about it. I hope to have my home still. I really hope to have my house. So that's why I feel like my success is such a necessity because it's like in order to save my home for my mother, for my family. My best girlfriend, Elizabeth McGlero, she, <laughs> she was my Italian best girlfriend. And uh, we were best friends at school. And she asked me to come home with her one day. And when we got to her house, her grandmother says, oh, but she can't come in the house. You know, I can't come in the house. So the grandmother knew she had no control over who the friends were at school. But you don't bring them home. That's a completely different thing. You know, but little children, they learn from the adults. And I guess whatever she had heard at home, you know, that, uh, you know, colored kids, as they were called then, um, you know, they were not to be a part of what was for white kids. And the race, I feel like racism never is going to go away. It's always going to be around because we still have parents teaching their kids about racism to be, oh, don't play with that kid because of this. Don't play with that kid because, you know, he's darker than you and such like, you know, that. So um, that's still going on. Growing up, I didn't really like see racism. I didn't see race, like I didn't see the differences in that until I actually went to school in Manhattan. Um, and then that's when I started seeing more white people um, and I started seeing more um, differences and people separating each other due, like because of those things. Like in the play, Linder is the face of that, and I think now it's kind of faceless. Like there isn't some like you, you don't see the person that like telling you, yo, you can't live here because you're you're this color, you're this. It, they just kind of neatly put it in like it. This is how much it costs for you. At that time, it was more about black white. Now it's more about prices, more about money. So if you can afford it, and you're an African American family and a white family can't afford it, I'm gonna take the African-American family. So it's like, it's, it, it's not really race anymore, but it's mostly financial. So some of you went to school in LaGuardia, and so I wanted to know if you can still feel on the surface the racial tension that happens between blacks and whites or blacks and Hispanics or Muslims and like can you feel any of that in your daily life or is it like now below the surface? I don't think it's gone. When I got here to LaGuardia, this is the most diverse place I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. This is the most diversity I've ever seen. Like mm -hmm. I've met people from literally everywhere. Yeah. I'm like, you're from where? <laughs> what part I've of the heard of it. <laughs> Get, I'm getting used to like multicultural environment. Yeah. So I don't see it yet. And when I get to LaGuardia, it's like, wow, everybody's different. And I see mm -hmm. all the flags, I'm like, wow, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, I it's wish great. a lot of um, really the schools good. in Brooklyn were like that because yeah. it was like mostly, mostly African-American Hispanics. I'm like, why can't we all get a little bit of yeah, exactly. I saw the flags. First thing I saw was the flags. Yeah. I was like, oh, it's nice. It's cool school. And then I just saw like um, Indians hanging out with African Americans, Afri African Americans hanging out with Hispanics. Like everyone was just cohesive. Everyone was just together. It was just like, oh, okay. And if they were kind of segregated, mm -hmm. it was because of a language barrier or something like that. It yeah, wasn't true. because, oh, I don't know you. Like, right. Yeah, yeah it wasn't like, oh, I don't. Yeah. Like, like it was yeah. more like it was a legit because we couldn't communicate. Yeah. You know, or we would do yeah. a smile, like just what. But LaGuardia is definitely one of the the most diverse schools I've ever been to. So now I have to say for the film, I didn't pay you to say this. <laughs> it makes me feel so wonderful, because that's, yeah. that's how I experience, but I'm not a student here. Mm -hmm. You know, so I never know. And as president, you know, people, they always show you the good side. So I always hear the good stuff, but I really, I really appreciate that. And yeah. it is, 
I mean, I do think you're the future of America, right? right. I mean, this college is the future. It's not the past, it's the future. So hopefully there's forward movement. And that's the cool thing about LaGuardia students, is that they come in with this amazing amount of depth, life experience, adversity, and channeling it in the right situation. Like this kind of work of going to a play like Raisin in the Sun and comparing it to what's happening today, um, it, it empowers the students to not only see that history matters, but also to see that like, I'm a part of this. They play a big part in what is what's to come. As you just saw, the film explores timely issues. So now let's speak to a few people involved in Raisin Rosedale. So the students participated in the play. They were learning their lines. They were reading the play. They had a read through. And along the way, they had these great discussions that were about, uh, well, how do I feel about that? You know, what would I do if I was that family trying to move into that neighborhood? If I'm a black family trying to move into the white neighborhood and there's some resistance, how, how would I handle that? Would I take the money to not do it, or would I, would I go for it? Um, and that just sparked these great conversations. And then I thought, oh, well, we have to go see where these kids live. You know, what's your experience in your neighborhood? But of the four students, two of them, that month, were getting priced out of their apartments. So basically, half of the students we were working with we're getting kicked out because of gentrification. I said, oh, well, that's the story. I was living in Brooklyn at the start of rehearsals, but by the time we started shooting, I had to move to Staten Island. The reason why I had to move is basically what the project was about. It was about gentrification and being pushed out of a neighborhood so another group of people can move in, and that's exactly what happened. So I understood, like, I lived in the shoes, so building the character was, it was easy for me. It was a collaborative idea between Sandy and I to take a look at what the students were processing about the play and uh, how they were approaching the play from their own point of view. So that came about as the play was being read at the table read. It wasn't something, at first we were just going to shoot these three scenes and that was it. But then as Sandy got to know the students and we got to start talking about the process of the theater, he was really interested in knowing more about the students' experience, how they were um, incorporating the play into their lives and how they were connecting to it. Stephanie, the theater director, was able to facilitate these great conversations with the students and said, what's happening in your life? What's happening in your neighborhood? How is, how is your life affected by race or uh, where you live or the climate in which uh, housing is happening in New York City? And that just spiraled into this great conversation about race and about gentrification, which was not our intention at all. I think what was interesting to me was that this was happening in their lives in the present moment. I didn't know that Cheyenne was literally moving out of her apartment and moving to Staten Island during that time. What Derek had said, that he, he felt like he couldn't win here. He felt like no matter where he goes, he just can't win. And, and that was devastating, actually, to hear. I see these students with as much capability as any other student in this country, you know? So I think that they are completely capable of um, of taking on this work. What's different about them is their willingness to inhabit the, the circumstances and to connect to the circumstances in their own lives and to just go there. The arc of students experiencing gentrification as sort of the, the reverse way in which um, the isolation by race and class really continues to happen in our country was a pretty profound experience. In other words, these major historical forces are not abstract, they're real, they're, they're with students every day. And the way in which their education then elucidated the, the larger frame of society was pretty powerful. 
watching those students experience both the play and the research and Clarice and their own experience of gentrification, you could see students who were the future of the United States. And in part that's because of their race, class, and color. It's just amazing to think of the diversity that's going to happen in our country. Because LaGuardia Community College is um, predominantly um, students who are immigrants, students who um, come from all different parts of the country, but also 80 or 90 percent of our students are students of color. They are the future. This is what America is going to look like. And the fact that we have to knit together all of the pieces of our history in the way that you can see happening in this film, I think profoundly um, presages what's going to happen in the world and how LaGuardia Community College is part of that. I'm so excited about this documentary. I mean, it, it's, I'm just so proud of it. I mean, there's so much material. When you make a documentary, for every minute, of that film, there's probably an hour or two hours of raw material. So to, to distill that down into these great stories um, and to, to capture the experience of the kids, of the students, while they were going through it is so exciting for me. And it's gotten a really great response and I'm just thrilled. I'm thrilled to highlight the college. I'm thrilled to show off the students and Stephanie and the theater program and the archives. It's just fantastic. That's our show for today. For any more information on this film, check out our website at cuny.tv or visit our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.